faithfulness. Um, our faithfulness. I spoke about faith a couple months ago, faith of a mustard seed, um, and all of that. And this is kind of about living that out, especially in difficult times or things like that. And we're going to be looking at the story um, from the book of Daniel of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we're just going to read the whole thing. So everybody just listen up. We're not going to have to put it on the screens, you know, use your ears. Andy's good at reading. And we're going to go through the whole story, and then I'm going to make a few points, and then we're going to go eat. So, Unroll your parchment scrolls to Daniel chapter 3. <laughs> King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other province officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men tied up that we threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, Your Majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree 
that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Amen. Let me pray. Father, bless your word. Let it sink down deep into the marrow of our bones. And we would become people of faith, faithful followers of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So, as I was praying for this message and I felt uh, that God wanted me to... Um, focus on this scripture, the phrase that came to my mind, the core, the part is uh, um, their response to the king when he's like, hey, you know, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to throw you in a furnace and who could save you from that, you know, and they say, well, we don't have to defend ourselves to you. And our God can't save us. He will. But even if he does not, we're still not going to do anything you just said. So the title of this, if there, you know, is Even If He Does Not. And I want to address our faithfulness, especially in the midst of suffering or challenging times or difficulty, all right? And I could have stopped this reading right at that point, you know? We're still not going to do this. And that would have probably illustrated fully everything we need to talk about today. But I think it was helpful, especially if you never heard this story, to know how it all ends up. So there's more that could be said about all of this, but we're going to talk today about our faith when it costs us something. And so I, I first, when you were thinking about this, as Christian people in America, it's rare that we find ourselves in a faith crisis that is a life or death situation. I am not going to say it's not ever happening, and maybe in past times it's happened more frequently, but for us, sitting here today, I, I, I would think that very few of us will find ourselves in, in, the, in, a, in, a, in like a one-for-one -one type situation like this, where because of your uh, faith, you will be put to death. Because of your faithfulness in God, you will be put to death. However, I think all of us are every day put in this situation in very small ways. And I think that can be, when you talk about eternity, you know, um, following Jesus and these kinds of things or not, the cumulative effect of many tiny cuts might be worse on our, you know, if the end result is destruction, you know, bowing to the enemy and this sort of thing. The, the cumulative effect of many tiny cuts uh, probably works better to bring many of us down because you don't always notice. Yeah this is not a big deal or that kind of thing. And it just builds up and builds up. And if you took that same person, us, and put us in a life or death type faith situation, we may respond more like this because the, it's like you take an image and the contrast is, is, you know, it's easier to see right and wrong sometimes in a very contrasted image. Not always, you know. But I think that we need to be thinking and praying and asking God. Sorry, I have a cold. I'm trying to not do that, but. Anyway, um, the, uh, is to be asking God, uh, show me um, these things. Because here's the deal. The, the world and the enemy, when I say the enemy, I mean the devil, Satan, um, is very, very interested in what we're bowing to. And the world's going to ask you every day, like I said, in small ways to bow bow, give authority to, you know, 
we think about terms like, in our culture, worship is something we would say, well, you know, that's something you do to God. I don't worship TV. That's silly, you know. Because we've kind of put this line between the spiritual world and the non-spiritual world or something like that. And when you, in the kind of Eastern mindset where the, the Bible is written, um, that line is not so firmly there, you know. Like they don't usually say things. There's a lot of discussion about what's the biblical view of even a person. You know, you've heard a lot of people say it's like, well, there's a spirit, a soul, a mind, a body. These divisions, you know, we make these divisions and... The Bible doesn't always treat things that way. I'm not saying those things don't exist. I'm just saying that, you know, we would say, well, is this affecting your soul or is this affecting your mind or is this affecting your spirit? You know, it's like, sure. You know, the Bible kind of is like, well, this is a man or a woman. You know, all of this is, you know. And so in ancient times and even now in some of the more Eastern cultures and and one of my point is and in ours, but it's even hidden, is this, uh, you know, you would worship gods of war so that you would win wars or you'd worship gods of, we'll say fertility today because <laughs> there's kids here, but you get the point, you know. Now, we just look at things on the Internet that we shouldn't look at, and we don't call it worshiping this idol. We've separated ourselves from this way of thinking when truthfully, that's exactly what we're doing because... When the world sets up an idol for us to worship, be it whatever it is, um, you see in this story, he's like, now when you hear all the, you know, instruments playing, he lists off what they are, but, you know, you hear the sound of the, you know, the call to worship, you respond accordingly. And when I think about the kind of things the world would have us bow to, you, are, you hear the call beforehand, you know, hey, it's time to, you know, it's time. And how do you respond to that? This is what we're talking about. Really lighthearted stuff. <laughs> I'm kidding, obviously. Um, I shouldn't kid. No, it's serious. The, uh, these things are destroying our lives. Um, and we don't even know. And we're sometimes not even approaching them as if they're a spiritual matter. You know, our addictions to things are a spiritual matter. And there's two mindsets I want to help correct with this. That I think we can easily find ourselves falling into. And at times you may uh, have believed this or you might believe this now. And if so, I think this is an error. And it's two things. One, that following God makes your life an easy life, a life free of struggle and all this kind of stuff. Judging by the, the laugh, I'm assuming most of you have learned that that's not true. <laughs> but the second thing is a little worse, a little more sneaky, I think it's this. That we don't obligate God to do anything for us by things we've done for Him. You know, like, well, I've done, you know, God, why are you letting this bad thing happen to me? I've done all this good stuff for you. This is not how this works. God is not obligated. You can't, God is not like a white magic spell. Where you're like, you have to do this because, you know, no. God doesn't have to do anything. You know, he'll never act against his nature, so he's not going to do bad things. But God doesn't, he's not obliged to work things out to the way we've just decided they should based on our very, very limited understanding of the world and everything and what's best for us and all that sort of thing. And, uh, um, this I think I see a lot. Uh, my wife and I went through an experience earlier this year um, where, like, our van broke, and it was, like, broke. Like, this is over. It's gone now. This was Tuesday, I think. And then, like, Wednesday, the dishwasher broke. That was not – that's not fixable. And then my computer broke, and it was kind of like, all right, don't touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, – I never quite got to the point where I was like, God, why are you breaking all our stuff? You know, but <laughs> I will say the temptation was there, you know. And depending on how, how well we're doing at any time we run into these sorts of difficulties, you know, you can easily find yourself, you know, like, God, you owe me. You know, it, it's, it's very sneaky how this could work into your mind, you know. And so um, the, the first point that I need to make to correct these things in light of this story we've just read is that life happens to everybody. Um, it's, it's, 
the Bible talks about it's appointed to man once to die. It's like we're all going to meet this. We all came into this world the same. We're all going to leave this world the same. And we try to fake in the middle while that we're all so different from each other. You know what I mean? Our experience is going to be the same. And no amount of money, prestige, fame, or anything can insulate you from life that just happens. And in, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 that... You know, the sun rises on the just and the unjust, and it causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the, and the unrighteous. It's kind of like, this is the world that we are in. And uh, funny thing about that, we always hear the, and I think it's kind of fun, you can use it either way, but typically in our culture, you know, I'm have, you know it's like a sad day is a rainy day kind of thing. But in, in a desert climate, the rain is a blessing, you know. So usually, that was really intended to mean like God blesses all sorts of people, you know doesn't always, you know, make sense to our mind, but bad things also happen to everybody, you know, and there's not always a correlation between following God and avoiding that or following God and increasing that. There is a time, you know, as we've seen in this story, that's, there comes times in your life where you're faced with the choice is very stark to follow God and not do something or follow God and do something or bow to the world. And uh, we have to be people that will not bow. And we have to do that in a way that doesn't obligate God, meaning that my faith is dependent on whether or not he delivers me from this. John 16, Jesus is encouraging his disciples about hard times coming ahead. Um, I've told you these things so that in, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So it's faith in the midst of being thrown into the fire, not avoiding it. Because it's going to happen. The second thing is, what I've already talked about a little bit, is that the world wants us to bow. Every day, we're being asked to bow to, um, no, you know what I'm talking about. I don't have to go into that. The, the bowing of our hearts and our wills to, um, if our lives don't look different than our um, unbelieving relatives or our unbelieving neighbors or co-workers, something's wrong. It doesn't mean everything is like, I don't go to baseball games because I'm a Christian. I mean, you, you can get weird also with that. <laughs> but my point is there should be a deep abiding hope that we have that in spite of all difficulties, we, ha we have a belief that God will deliver us. And, we, and, we, and we, we must not bow just to fit in or be seen as part of society. I don't know, you know, whatever that thing is. And, and, and where do you bow? That's the question I wrote down. And the third is a faith in the deliverance. I think in their response that they say, we don't have to defend ourselves to you. And our God can deliver us, and he will. And in this story, it happens like right now. Um, bearing in mind, they get thrown into a furnace, okay? So you don't exactly avoid it. Now, they're in the furnace walking around, and they're unsinged, you know? And the, so when we can adopt this level of faith and faithfulness, that is how we can experience the struggles of our lives. I am not there. I have been there. There's been times. And I'm sure we could all share testimonies of that, God's faithfulness and our ma like, it's like amazing things that we've done in God's name. But the, uh, the, the <laughs> I think when they're saying he will deliver us, I hear an echo of that. Like when Jesus goes to raise Lazarus from the dead, he encounters Martha, the sister, and 
um, he encounters, you know, people on the way in, and you know the story, but she says, he's like, don't be sad, you know, your brother will live again, and he means like today, and she's saying, oh, I know, I know that at the end of, because the, the Jews at the time had faith in the, you know, an end time, like that at the end of all things, God is going to have the last word, and he'll raise up his people to everlasting life, this is what we believe, you know, and She's saying, I believe that. Like, I know God will have the last word, you know. And he's like, no, no, I mean, like, right now, you know. <laughs> let, me, let me help you edit that. And I think I, I hear that in what these guys are saying, that, like, God can deliver us, and he will. Meaning, like, it may take thousands of years, but you don't get the last word at this thing. You know what I mean? Like, we might just die right now, you know. That's why I think they say even if he doesn't, you know, because they're like, you know, God will deliver us. You know, implies kind of now like you like right now we would be delivered, but I think they know in the back of their mind. You know, eventually God's going to win in this situation, and you have to remember this, <laughs> especially in dark, dark times. It's like, you know, I wrote a song, uh, which if I ever record <laughs> finish recording another album, it will be on it, and it was about an end times prayer that I was thinking to myself. You know, um, it was before we decided to name our church Maranatha. This was last spring or something. And I started singing this uh, while I was working on this building. And I named the song Maranatha. I may not by the time it ever comes out. But it was just this, uh, I'll just sing it for you. It went like this. God's going to make it right somehow. God's going to make it right somehow. God's going to make it right somehow. Everything that's broken now, he's going to make it right somehow. And I think that kind of faith we can all uh, hold on to. It's like, I don't know how this is going to work, but I know that everything that's broken now, he's going to make right. But then there's times where he does it right now. (laughs) And those are awesome. And I'm not saying they're greater, but they certainly feel good. We have to have faith in God's ultimate deliverance for all of us who believe in his name. John, 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. We just read in uh, John 16 that Jesus says, Don't take heart, I've overcome the world. Like your faith in me, like you're an overcomer like me. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So the only bowing that we do as believers is to the Son of God, Jesus. We bow to Him totally. And this faithfulness, this faith that we have is surrender to... That's what the bowing is. I've heard people say it's like when you bow before a king or a leader... It was showing, it was, it was a defenseless posture. They could cut your head off because, you, you know, you're down, you know. So we only do that to Jesus, and we fully do that to Jesus, and we do not do that anywhere else. That's the difference in our lives and our um, unbelieving friends. And that's really all I need to say. But here's the thing. When you look at... Uh, this experience. You see, they threw in three guys, and there's a fourth guy in there. And he looks like the Son of God. Who's the Son of God? <laughs> so I don't know. The, uh, it could be an angel. It could be Jesus himself. Um, there's a term for that when we have these kind of pre-incarnational um, Pictures of Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. I believe this is one of them. And, uh, but he makes right on that because it's this. It can seem uh, easy for you to say everything I'm saying right now or like, I get it. I have to try harder, you know, and that's not what I'm getting at because, frankly, that doesn't really work. You do have to try and you do have to say no to bowing to the idols of this world on a daily basis. But you're not saying that, um, and you're not saying, well, I'll put my faith in God, you know, because he's God and I have to, or else, you know, 
he's God, so I don't have another choice, you know. In fact, that is true, but uh, surrendering to God becomes increasingly easy the more we know about God, the more we understand the nature of Jesus. When you think of how good you think God is, he's far better than that. <laughs> and the more we encounter God in his kindness, um, in his goodness, um, it becomes easier and easier to surrender to him and trust him. And partially, what I would get at with that is that um, the picture here is that Jesus is with them in the fire. He's not standing above it, you know. He's not floating above the fire. He's not standing outside of it. He's in there with them. So when you're in the fire, where do you think he is? Now, we were talking about Easter coming up. This is, this is Jesus coming to this world to save us from the curse of sin and being faithful all the way to death on a cross. And that He doesn't avoid this. I have this, a friend of mine made. I asked him, he was a blacksmith, and I was like, can you make me like a... a uh, kind of a crucifixion nail, just to, I would have it. And while I was sitting there praying and putting this together, I saw this on the shelf. And I was like, well, you know, that's why it's, pretty, it's easy to put faith in Jesus, because he puts his, mon- he puts his uh, faith into action, <laughs> money where his mouth is, you know what I'm saying? God could have avoided this. He could have just wiped the whole thing out, and instead... He loves us so much that he'll endure the greatest, and even greater, this is just a physical representation of, you know, the separation from God he experienced. So all these things, I don't know, you know, how the the deep, dark, the overcoming of sin was costly to God. That's worth pondering. But the, uh, when they would crucify somebody, they would nail, nail them to a cross like this that we have up here, with nails like this. And he, he doesn't avoid that, especially when the people around him are saying, you know, if you were really God, you would call on angels and they would come take you down, all this kind of stuff, you know. He's the faithful one. I'm going to read you this. It's kind of interesting. So while I was praying, all of these things were just sitting on my desk and I was grabbing them, so... See what we get next time. But no, I'm just kidding. But the, uh, this book was sitting there, and it had a bookmark in it. Okay? So I just pulled it out and opened it. Let me just here just read this here. This bookmark was already in here. I did not put this in here. The alternatives are these. Well, we'll set this up a little bit. The, you, we find ourselves in this kind of dark place about faith in, in spite of uh, suffering or in spite of um, trusting God through difficult times. We find this a lot in the medical world. When you get a dire, you know, it, it, actually, honestly, everything Kayla shared this was exactly what I was like, well, I could probably not preach. That was fine, what she just said, you know. <laughs> She's saying, I, my daughter has this, and I have faith, but I have to decide to move forward with this, because this is just the life that God has put here. I mean, it was just a life that happened. I don't know, you know. And God is faithful, and I'm going to trust him through this. And uh, the challenge of our faith when we're faced with, you know, dire medical, you know, situations, uh, it can be very testing. So he says this, the alternatives are these. Either he, he God, will heal us from the infirmity Or else he will give us power to use the infirmity. In either case, it is a way out of the difficulty. When people ask me to pray that they may be healed, I always reply that I will, provided that in case God should refuse, they will not lose their faith in him. I'm going to read that again. Hey, guys, come on up here. And I want to play that uh, song we opened with to close. We're going to end on a high note. In either case, it is a way out of the difficulty. When people ask me to pray 
that they may be healed, I always reply that I will, provided that in case God should choose, but should God should refuse, they will not lose their faith in him. For I feel that it is more important that we keep our faith than we keep our health. With the faith intact, even though healing is denied, we are ready for the second alternative. Namely, that we can employ the infirmity in the purposes of a higher good. You have to see the cross in this. Jesus uses this worst thing ever to be done to bring salvation to the world. He can certainly use the bad things in our lives for good. And he goes on to this. When a storm strikes an eagle flying, he sets his wings in such a way that the air currents send him above the storm by their very fury. The set of the wings does it. That's our part. That's the faith. The Christian is not spared the pains and sorrows and sicknesses that come upon other people, but he is given an inner set of the spirit by which he rises above these calamities, by the very fury of the calamities themselves. I'm going to read that again. But he is given an inner set, the wings are set, of the spirit by which he rises above these calamities by the very fury of the calamities themselves. So we're going to sing um, that song we opened with, You Are God and There Is No Other, to kind of bookmark or book in, sorry, book into this whole service. And um, if you want to come up and pray, that's fine. Or you just want to sing. Let's just sing. Uh, we're going to lift up the name of Jesus in this place. And Father, I pray that you would make us people who are faithful, especially in difficult times.